I'm Bonnie Mohan. I'm with the Health and Housing Consortium. Thank you so much for joining this event. Um, this is the first time we've put on an event like this. It's um, an opportunity to, um, to talk about the, the report that the city has issued on deaths among persons experiencing homelessness and really have a conversation um, and bring together um, folks from the city as well as clinici clinicians serving this population to talk about what we can be doing to um, prevent deaths um, of, of homeless New Yorkers. So um, it's gonna be a really great discussion. Um, we really just, it's also a difficult discussion and a difficult topic. And so I just want to um, extend um, on behalf of um, the Health and Housing Consortium and our co-sponsor, Homeless Services United, um, who I thank for their, their help in putting this event together. We just want to thank all of you, the service providers who are working um, with this population for all the work that you do and have done for years and particularly in this past year. Um, it has been uh, undeniably difficult. There has been um, an incredible loss of life. Um, you know, the, the people that you serve, and that's a real loss and grief for you as well. Um, and also many of you have, many of us have lost colleagues and coworkers um, to COVID in this past year. So um, just thank you for, for continuing to go to work every day and for, for doing this work and really just want to recognize you all for that. Um, I want to run through a few logistics for the event before um, we kick things off. First, um, everyone is on mute with video off. Um, if you have questions, please put them into the Q&A function. Um, there is a chat box open as well. That's more for sharing resources, saying hello, um, having a conversation with fellow attendees, but um, it's much easier for us to keep track of questions if you put those into the Q&A box. And um, if you are using the chat box again, please uh, send the message to panelists, all panelists and attendees so that others can see as well. Um, we have uh, live subtitles available, so you can enable those on the bottom of your screen by clicking live transcript. Um, and then there is also an option to view the full transcript, which will put a pane on your on the side of your screen um, at, with who is talking and, um, and that can be a very useful function. I just wanna let you know that that's available. We will have an evaluation poll uh, towards the end of the event that's gonna come up during the Q&A. Um, that, that really does help us to know um, how we did on this event, if it was helpful to you. And then we have an open-ended uh, survey that we would ask that you complete to give us feedback on what other events and topics would be helpful um, for you. So please do um, complete that poll um, at the end. I think that that is um, all of the logistics. So I will go ahead and hand off to um, our, um, Here's, I'm sorry, here's the agenda for the day. We'll have um, our moderator, Dr. Kelly Doran, will give introductions of our panelists. Each panelist will speak for seven to 10 minutes, and then we'll have a, a really good amount of time for moderated Q&A and discussion. So we really look forward to your questions. And again, the poll and evaluation at the end. So now I will hand it off to our moderator, Dr. Kelly Doran, who's an assistant professor at the um, uh, NYU School of Medicine and um, in the Departments of Population Health and Emergency Medicine. Dr. Doran. Thank you so much, Bonnie. And thank you everyone for joining today. Uh, we're here to talk about a really important issue, literally an issue of, of life and death here in New York City. As you'll hear today, 613 New Yorkers were identified by the New York City Department of Homeless Services in the office of the Chief Medical Examiner as having died while they were experiencing homelessness in fiscal year 2020. This was an increase of 52% from 404 deaths in FY 2019, which was itself an increase of 39% from 290 deaths in FY 18. While today we'll be focusing on New York, this is not an issue that's unique to our city. Deaths among people experiencing homelessness have been increasing nationwide and even worldwide. For example, England, Wales, and Scotland all saw approximately 10% increases in deaths among people experiencing homelessness in the past year alone. In Los Angeles, deaths among people experiencing homelessness have risen 30% since 2014. And last year alone, 2019 alone, they recorded over 1,200 homeless individuals who had died. And we all know that on average, people who are homeless die decades earlier than their house counterparts. The causes of these deaths and the increases that we're seeing are multifactorial. The worldwide overdose crisis has hit the homeless population especially hard and drug-related causes, in large part overdose, are now the leading cause of death among people experiencing homelessness pretty much across the board. 
The aging of a homeless population, a phenomenon we've seen not just in New York City, but nationwide, undoubtedly also contributes. And of course, the COVID-19 pandemic, especially here in New York City, contributed to an increase in deaths among people experiencing homelessness last year. And with that, I wanted to pause for a moment of silence because as we all know, behind each statistic is a human being, someone's son, daughter, brother, sister, or friend, a person who had hopes and dreams, loves and hates, a past and an unlived future. So let us remember now the people who have lost their lives in New York City and also around the world in hopes that they rest in peace and that we may honor their memory by doing everything in our power to prevent such deaths and to end the unnecessary and unacceptable crisis of homelessness. Thank you. The goal of today's event is not only to describe the characteristics and trends of deaths among homeless New Yorkers, but to discuss together how to enhance existing services and resources and build new ones to prevent deaths in the future. I'd now like to introduce our panel with deep gratitude that they're sharing their knowledge with us today and also for all of their very important work. First, Dr. Fabian Larocque will present results from the 2020 annual report on deaths among persons experiencing homelessness in New York City. Dr. Larocque is the medical director of the New York City Department of Homeless Services. She is an internal medicine and preventive medicine physician. And before joining DHS, she spent two decades in a variety of, ro of roles in the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. After Dr. Larocque's presentation, each of our remaining panelists will share information about their own work with homeless New Yorkers as well as their thoughts on gaps and opportunities to reduce mortality among homeless New Yorkers in the future. First, we will have Dr. Andrea Littleton, who is the direct medical director at Bronx Works. She is also the faculty advisor for the Homeless Outreach Project at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine, the faculty leader for the homeless track of the Family Medicine Residency Program, and a clinician with Care for the Homeless. Next, Dr. Jonathan Giftos is the Medical Director of Addiction Medicine and Drug User Health at Project Renewal. Previously, Dr. Giftos served as the Clinical Director of Substance Use Treatment for the New York City Health and Hospitals Division of Correctional Health Services at Rikers Island. Finally, we'll hear from Dr. Tony Carino, who's the Director of Psychiatry at Janian Medical Care and is a psychiatrist for people experiencing street homelessness and serious mental health conditions through the Bronx Works Homeless Outreach Team and CUCS ACT Team in the Bronx. After the panelists speak, we'll have time for Q&A. As Bonnie mentioned, please put questions for the panelists in the Q&A and use the chat box to share resources or comments. We're going to turn it over now to Dr. Andrea Littleton. Can I just make a point? I know um, we, uh, I hope we'll have the opportunity uh, at the end to talk about all the use of the data. Uh, Okay, so thank you, Kellyanne, for that nice introduction, and thank you, Dr. Lara, for sharing um, that information. It's really helpful for us to talk about this and reflect on, uh, you know, a very difficult year that we that we've had. So. I'm going to share uh, the work that we do here at Bronx Works and Care for the Homeless um, and, and what we've experienced over the last year. So Bronx Works, I'm the medical director of FOUR, which is a community organization in the Bronx that does a lot of advocacy uh, for many things, uh, for children, senior citizens, and families, but a large arm of what we do is homeless services. Uh, we have uh, over uh, eight uh, homeless shelters that we run um, between safe havens and drop-in shelters and family shelters. Um, we also have supportive housing um, and we are the uh, team that does street outreach for the Bronx um, for DHS. Next slide. Uh, and the other part of what I do is I am a clini clinician for Care for the Homeless, so I provide medical care at the living room, which is our drop-in shelter in 
the Hunts Point area. Um, and Care for the Homeless has uh, clinics in many different shelters throughout uh, four of the boroughs of the city um, and provide both primary care as well as uh, dental mental health services. Um, and we do the street outreach for the Bronx. Next slide. So we have a great partnership, Bronx Works and Montefiore, uh, Bronx Works and Care for the Homeless. Um, and we, uh, through our partnership, uh, have been able to do a street outreach team. Um, and the homeless outreach team goes out 24 seven um, and engages with our unsheltered clients um, to get them to come indoors. Um, and the clients that they see that have medical needs um, our medical outreach team then uh, tries to engage with them. Um, and our medical outreach team goes out twice a week. Um, it consists of myself, uh, my substance use counselor, and a medical assistant. Go to the next slide. So one of the things that we've realized, uh, especially with this partnership, is that the key to better housing is, uh, to, to better health is housing. Um, and so we've been partnering with Bronx Works to be able to do that um, in partnership as well with DHS, who has been able to provide us with uh, stabilization beds uh, to house some of our clients that are on the street and try to get them a room very quickly, um, which was very critical, especially during this pandemic. Um, Bronx Works has done a wonderful job with getting people in off of the street um, and the hope count that is done every year to track how many people are on the street um, has shown a marked reduction in how many people have been on the street in the Bronx, which speaks to how well our outreach team has been um, in terms of engagement um, and being able to get our homeless clients in doors off the street. Um, in 2005, we had over 587 street homeless clients. Um, and based on the numbers from the last HOPE count that was done earlier this year, um, we only had 81 individuals, which was a tremendous reduction. Um, and one of the things that we found with our team that makes it so successful is really engagement. Um, and the more interactions that we have with people, the more likely they are to come indoors. Um, and having the ability to have the flexibility to be able to get them into these uh, stabilization beds, which are kind of like SROs. They're, you know, they usually have a shared room with one other person um, with a shared kitchen and bath on that floor. Um, there's no curfews, there's no security. Um, so it's much more flexible for patients um, and for people who uh, don't like the strict criteria of a lot of the shelters, um, it works for them a lot better. Next slide. As we had, as Dr. Larock had shared with us, the leading cause of death uh, was certainly drug related. And so a large part of this, the, the outreach that we do on the street um, has been our street map program. Um, we, we found that a lot of our clients who are still on the street um, are really there either for uh, untreated chronic mental illness or for their active substance use. Um, I have been a prescriber of Suboxone since my residency, so we had initiated, started doing induct street inductions of people who are suffering from opiate use disorder, um, both to engage with them to get um, housing, um, but also to help them kind of stabilize their addiction so that they can start to work on, um, on getting more permanent housing. Um, we've been fairly successful with that. Um, the numbers on the slide, I'm sorry, I guess had been lost, but um, we have engaged with over, I think it was 118 clients that we had totally engaged with over the past year um, and per actively engaged in the program. We have about 28 clients. Um, since we had started the program, we've placed about 38 clients in uh, safe haven rooms, and I think we had gotten about eight of them into permanent housing. Um, so it, it's been a very successful program um, for engagement, um, and we are usually able to provide them with buprenorphine either on the same day or getting it out to them the following day, which for a lot of clients works better because usually they've recently used and can't actually start it on the day that we meet with them. Um, as part of that program, a lot of what we do is harm reduction. Um, we have a syringe exchange. We also do a lot of Narcan training um, and make sure that all of our clients and their friends and family have uh, Narcan. Next slide. 
Uh, in terms of overdose deaths, uh, despite a lot of our training and distribution of Narcan, um, we have been successful in a lot of revivals of overdoses. Um, we've had many over uh, the past year, um, but we have had uh, a two overdose deaths actually over the past year. Um, one was just recently, um, and it was in one of our stabilization buildings. Um, and it, it kind of spoke to, uh, it was, it seemed preventable. It seemed like there was actually a witness to it, although the, the client had said that they were both asleep and woke, when they woke up was when they found them. Um, and it is one of our stabilization beds that's staffed. And so we have, um, we actually had uh, a case manager on site um, and, and unfortunately, although they were trained um, to give it no matter what, for, for various reasons of the scenario, they did not. And so it really spoke to us of, you know, kind of the need to constantly retrain um, and remind people of the importance of using it and also just making it kind of more visible um, in our stabilization um, sites so that it's easily located um, for people when they need it. The other client who had passed away from an overdose was found in his room and unfortunately I think was using a loan and so you know that's unfortunately one of the drawbacks of, of isolation um, is sometimes when you're not being witnessed um, with your drug use uh, you could have a risk certainly um, if nobody's there to give you Narcan um, of having an overdose. Next slide. Uh, so this was just kind of reviewing some of the, the details of the death report for the Bronx um, and seeing the numbers, uh, you know, it's, it's helpful because it helps us with targeting our outreach efforts and clearly from the numbers, it does look like there were uh, a lot of deaths in district shelter districts that are in Morrisania and in Highbridge and in Morris Heights and, and we have been targeting a lot um, of outreach in Highbridge there's a lot of uh, substance use uh, in that area. And it's also one of the sites that we've been doing a lot of street outreach. Next slide. Uh, and dealing with COVID, it's, it has been a very difficult year. The living room is a drop in shelter. So social isolation is, is, is was near impossible here. Um, DHS has been, was extremely helpful with helping us be able to isolate our clients in, in, in creating the isolation hotels. We also had a second drop-in that was established uh, close by, about 10 blocks away, Washington Avenue. Um, and where DHS was extremely helpful with supplying us with regular COVID testing, um, as well as helping us with uh, distributing COVID vaccine. We had some cluster of cases um, in, in a lot of our sites, uh, surprisingly not so much at the living room, but at some of our family sites with, within uh, Bronx Works, um, as well as the Pyramid, which is one of our other safe havens. Um, but uh, those clusters were handled and surprisingly, we didn't have any deaths that we know of directly from COVID. Um, in terms of, um, I'm sorry, if you could go back to just that one slide, I was, uh, for our hot team, there were uh, nine known deaths over the past year. Um, two were of unknown etiology. Two, um, we believe one uh, were from heart attack. Um, one person was a known cocaine user. Unfortunately, we did have one death of one of our clients who actually hadn't been engaging with us um, regularly um, as based on the weather, um, and he did suffer from alcoholism. We had the two overdose deaths that I mentioned. Um, we also had one of our clients who uh, died in the hospital from complications from a stab wound. Um, and unfortunately, one of our clients who had gotten hit by a subway um, from intoxication. Next slide. So in terms of things that work, um, you know, uh, definitely kind of collaborating um, the different organizations has really helped us do the work that we do. So I think continuing that those collaborations um, with other organizations and with hospitals is critically important. Um, it really takes a village to try to help meet a lot of our clients' needs. Um, we do Bronx Works, the outreach team has a vulnerable list of clients that we know who are on the street, and that really helps us target our outreach, especially um, uh, when it's really cold and when it's really hot. Uh, we know usually where to find people to try to engage with them to come indoors. 
Um, we also have a list of the encampment areas that people live and we can usually try to find them in those places. Um, the outreach team does a great job um, really by using a lot of motivational interviewing to get people to want to come in and I think trying to meet people where they're at and usually trying to find a housing um, scenario that works best for them um, is really helpful. Um, it's been really helpful for us to be able to go out to the to where they're at um, and meeting them where they're at and I think being able to do the street mat where we can actually talk to people where they are and get them started um, really helps and a lot of times it really bolsters them being engaged in coming back into care. We also have a team psychiatrist on our field and Dr. Carino, I'm excited to hear your, your take on this. He's a part of our team and we have shared patients that we work together with. We use, uh, we try to connect with people when they go to the hospital to see why they're there and actively engage with, when the, with them when they come out. Um, and all those things really have helped us. Um, there are a lot of issues with kind of getting people housing and challenges with that. Um, and as we've all seen with this pandemic, um, being able to have your own space is really, really important. So um, I'm hoping that uh, with this crisis, we can kind of bolster up uh, the priority of getting people permanent housing and realizing that it's an important part of their health. I think that's, I think that was it for me. Thank you, Dr. Littleton. And I really loved your last point about the importance of housing for health. And now we'll turn it over to Dr. Jonathan Giftos. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Um, very glad to be here. My name is John Giftos. I'm the Medical Director for Addiction, Medicine, and Drug User Health at Project Renewal, which is a, um, uh, one of the organizations in New York City that provides uh, housing, health care, and uh, jobs to people experiencing homelessness. Um, it's, it's great to be alongside Dr. LaRock and Dr. Littleton and Dr. Carino. And um, I'm going to focus my section just a little more narrowly on drug-related harms during the past year. Um, and in doing so, kind of highlighting some of the work we've done to minimize those. Um, I, I just don't want to, uh, I want to sort of acknowledge that our organization's done a lot to sort of mitigate other harms uh, of, of COVID, for example. Um, and uh, while I can't focus on those today, um, we'd be happy to speak about those as well. Um, so I'm just going to um, briefly review some common drug-related harms and then list some concerns regarding the impact of, of the pandemic and COVID on those harms. Uh, I'm going to describe some interventions uh, by the city and by Project Renewal to minimize those harms. Um, and I'm going to close by summarizing a, a Project Renewal survey um, that we did on the impact of hoteling on people's uh, general well-being and um, in, with a focus on drug-related harms. Next slide, please. So I always start any sort of talk about um, drug use and, and interventions by focusing on you know, five major harms. Um, overdose death is, of course, the one that uh, is sort of the tip of the knife and uh, the one that we'll be focusing on today. But you know, drug use is associated with injuries, um, uh, as noted by Dr. Littleton earlier, that can sometimes lead to death, um, infections, uh, social isolation, and uh, acquisitive crime and incarceration. Next slide, please. And when during the pandemic, we were really worried that the that COVID was going to uh, exacerbate uh, the risks that, for many of our clients. Uh, each of these harms, uh, we knew that stress may lead to make quick, more chaotic use. That medications that reduce risk of overdose may be harder to access. Um, that isolation may increase risk of unobserved uh, incidents. Um, we knew that reusing injection equipment might increase risk of infections for those who couldn't access um, sterile syringes, or that people may delay seeking health care if they experience injuries because of fears of hospitals. Um, we knew that sharing injection equipment would be more common if unable to access syringe services programs. We knew that isolation would be a strategy to reduce COVID transmission, but that there might be collateral consequences for those experiencing addiction. Um, including, uh, you know, a uh, higher risk of unobserved overdose. Um, we also know that recovery support became increasingly difficult to access during the, the pandemic. Um, and employment was hard for clients to access and those who uh, were using um, substances that required a lot of money to sustain their use might be pressured more towards acquisitive crime and, um, and arrest. Next slide, please. 
We know that the pandemic, uh, that COVID-19 was associated with higher overdose rates nationally. This is some data from the CDC um, with uh, significant increases in many states of, of overdose rates. Next slide. And we know from the data that Dr. LaRock presented that there was an increase in the absolute number of overdose deaths in fiscal year 2020 um, and uh, from around 115, my slides cut off here, but from around 115 to I think 130 or so. Um, next slide, please. So we um, were very kind of concerned about this at Project Renewal. We manage many shelters. Um, some of them are dedicated to, uh, for people who are experiencing addiction. Um, and so we were worried about the impact of the pandemic on in particular overdose rates. Um, our shelter overdose incidents um, prior to the pandemic, we would have 10 to 20 um, naloxone uh, administrations per month. Um, these were mostly non-fatal overdoses and we had, um, you know, extensive training of staff and we distributed naloxone to staff and to, and to clients. Um, and so uh, we were experiencing about 10 to 20 overdose incidents um, per month. Next slide, please. And so with hoteling, we knew there was going to be clear value for COVID mitigation, but would private or semi-private rooms increase risk of overdose? We know, as others have mentioned, that using a loan is one of the major risk factors for a fatal overdose as it's more likely to go unnoticed. Next slide. But what we saw actually was when hoteling began, we saw uh, actually a fewer overdose incidents. At, sorry, go back, please. Fewer overdose incidents um, in our uh, hotels and in our shelters. Um, and this, of course, is, is complicated data. Many of our clients were um, moved around a lot during this time. Some were transferred into housing. There was a lot of things going on. But what was clear to us was we didn't actually see a dramatic increase in, in overdose events um, when we did hotel um, the vast majority of the clients living in our shelters. Next slide, please. And so to better understand the impact of hoteling on a variety of health indicators, we conducted a survey of, of many of our uh, hotel clients. And we found that 77% um, said their physical health was a little or much better after hoteling. 78% said their mental health was a little or much better. 89% that their ability to protect themselves from COVID was a little or much better. 59% said that bup and methadone were easier to access uh, while they were in the hotel. I think partly that was that it was easier to store it safely in their hotel room. Um, and 59% said that they were using much less of their substances that they were struggling with before um, when compared to being in the shelter. Another 13% said they were using a little less. So it was, it was pretty clear through the survey that many felt their health was better and their, their drug use was actually more stabilized. Next slide, please. What this um, kind of hoteling experience like helped us kind of focus in on was the real important kind of need to be integrated across our organization. Uh, we knew that um, the housing side, the shelter, the nutritional support, the social services, um, the wellness checks by staff, uh, visiting people in their rooms were all critical to keeping people safe. Um, as well as having quick access to the other healthcare services that our organization could provide, medical and psych care, testing and treating infections. We have low threshold buprenorphine um, available for people via telehealth. Um, our outpatient addiction treatment center started going into the hotels to offer groups um, in some of the, uh, the conference rooms and things like that. Um, our crisis programs had to operate at reduced census, but they remained open. Um, and so we really needed to focus on integration around this time. Uh, that our that movement was limited and that our clients were moved around a lot across the city. Last slide. And just to close, I just wanted to talk about the kind of one intervention we um, we did employ over the last year that was incredibly helpful was we 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 built out a rapid access drug user health services program that centered around um, linking people who use drugs via um, peer engagement, shelter staff, and other um, project renewal staff to a nurse care manager for drug user health, who's an RN that has special specialization in triaging and assessing the needs of people um, who use drugs and connecting them to the variety of services that we can provide at Project Renewal. 
Um, this has allowed us to kind of create a single point of contact for a large organization with a sort of scattered population to connect into uh, critical services um, when needed. And uh, this position has been extremely helpful for us uh, to try to minimize some of the harms of the pandemic for our uh, population who uses drugs. Um, so I'll close there and um, trans, uh, well now I think hear from Dr. Carino and look forward to answering questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Gistos. And you are correct. We will turn it over now to Dr. Carino. Hi, thanks so much, uh, Kelly. And uh, thanks so much to uh, the esteemed colleagues that I'm speaking with. Um, I also appreciate that, you know, we began by uh, bringing into the space the acknowledgement of those that we have lost uh, over this last year. Um, and this is a really, really important topic. Um, and, uh, and so I wanted to uh, just introduce uh, a certain perspective that, that we have. I'm, the, I'm Tony Carino, Director of Psychiatry at Janey and Medical Care. Um, I work in a, a homeless outreach team with Bronx Works, um, serving people with chronic street homelessness in the Bronx. In addition to a CUCS ACT team providing assertive community treatment uh, to folks in the Bronx experiencing homelessness um, with high utilization of behavioral health services. Um, and I think it helps to sort of just begin by our talking about our strategy at Janney and medical care and um, and how we've adapted it to to address uh, some of these significant risks uh, for the people that were called to serve. Um, so our model um, at Janney and medical care uh, really began uh, with uh, PPOH. Um, we began as a nonprofit in the 80s, started by psychiatrists to address the uh, homelessness crisis that was occurring and the project for psychiatric outreach to homeless the idea was that the human relationship is key and uh, and that that relationship to connect with people with severe mental health conditions is an important aspect of uh, recovery and an important and key feature of, of decreasing uh, uh, illness and death um, we've grown into Janie and medical care and provide integrated care um, in terms of our psychiatric services, uh, we're at um, uh, 61 different program sites, and we serve in eight street, street psychiatry teams, um, 11 transitional housing te uh, teams, um, and four intensive mobile treatment teams, two ACT teams, um, and uh, 32 uh, permanent supportive housing. The idea is that you have psychiatrists that are highly trained out there um, in the community um, embedded in community services where people with homelessness go for care. And uh, when, when clients graduate uh, from one step of homelessness to, to the next, when they move from outreach to transitional housing to permanent housing, there's actually some continuity and you have a, a, a psychiatrist or psychiatric provider to sort of work with them in their path from street to shelter to home and further to recovery. Um, and uh, we have a group of 32 psychiatric providers that is really motivated uh, to serve uh, this patient population that we're called to serve. Um, so I think our model is, is based on the idea that um, engagement is key and actually by, by, and by acknowledging the psychiatric and behavioral health needs of, of people experiencing uh, street homelessness um, that you can make a big difference um, and connect people with treatment, housing, um, and reduce harm. Um, one of the things that uh, I think is, is sort of at play here and, and kind of in the air in this discussion is the concept of the syndemics um, and a, a population health, public health concept um, with the idea that uh, multiple epidemics uh, uh, may co-occur and, um, and impact certain populations in um, intense and synergistic ways. Oftentimes with uh, syndemic, um, there's an exacerbation by some structural or psychosocial conditions. And I think um, this population of, of people that we're called to serve is struggling and really vulnerable to the syndemics. And by that, I think um, what, I'm, what I'm speaking to is that um, there's the direct effect of COVID-19 leading to death, um, but we also have our opiate overdose and substance use um, deaths, and also a, a real tsunami of psychiatric and behavioral health sequelae um, that are related to this um, uh, pandemic, but also had been on the rise for a while. And I think some of the things that we've experienced uh, may be helpful in, in thinking about reducing risk um, and decreasing mortality for this important population. 
First off, um, just thinking about the direct effect of COVID-19, um, one of the things that we um, uh, did was just to, to move towards social distancing, um, education, and moving people um, uh, to safer environments very quickly with the support of DHS and, and others to, to move people to hotels. Um, one of the other, uh, one of the things that we found as well is that by having clinicians that have a relationship with people and sticking with them, that the folks that we serve were more likely to accept vaccines, to um, sort of adhere and, and stick with um, guidelines to decrease risk to them in terms of uh, COVID-19 and the direct effects of that. Um, uh, we use a, an approach of motivational interviewing to, to empower people with decision making around vaccine decisions um, and employ uh, a lot of the elements that we use psychiatrically to help uh, boost motivation to people. Um, we also activated our consumer advisory board members to educate us on the best ways to talk with people about vaccine and acceptance and, uh, and, and vaccine decision making. Um, the other thing that uh, we've really attempted to do is to address the um, substance use crisis and in particular the opiate overdose crisis. Um, some of the strategies that we've been able to employ have involved things that the other colleagues have talked about. Um, this uh, we, we do a lot in terms of engagement. So having um, the psychiatric provider out there on the front lines and the teams out there on the front mm -hmm. lines talking with people about um, reducing use. We found some real benefit in uh, doing uh, uh, training around harm reduction directly um, providing Narcan training to people and people in their environments um, uh, by educating people around use of fentanyl test strips so people can test their supply and get a sense of actual fentanyl contamination, which we've seen results in a dialogue, a conversation, and oftentimes can result in suboxone. Um, in addition to um, syringe exchange um, on the streets and where people are at. Um, and we found that these elements are helpful and if they're associated with low threshold uh, suboxone induction and other medication assisted therapy um, that the uptake of MAT can be really helpful and, and improve. Um, we've also um, taken an approach of population health and looking at um, where there's hot spots in terms of overdoses and really saturating Narcan training throughout the whole system um, wherever there's overdoses that occur. Uh, but And, and most uh, significant that we've seen in terms of changes is dealing with the other aspect of this endemic, which is the rise in depression, suicide, and psychiatric worsening that we see. Uh, one third of people with COVID will develop a new psychiatric illness um, six months after the, the illness itself. Um, and we know that there's exacerbation and worsening of psychiatric conditions. Um, after SARS-1, um, there was a certain increase in suicide uh, in the population that experienced uh, uh, SARS-1. Um, and, uh, and, and you know, we would expect that to increase um, in this population with SARS-CoV-2. Some of the things that we've done um, to address this have been actually a, a rapid move to a hybrid model of care where psychiatrists can um, engage people face-to-face -face, um, and then also flip to telepsychiatry, telehealth, provide motivational interviewing, harm reduction, psychotherapy. Um, and keep that relationship going. We've been surprised that we've been able to increase our access to visits um, in some program sites, boosting them between 11 to 17%, actually in some sites, in which um, we've been able to increase visits and stay with our patients using this hybrid model, um, which has high satisfaction rates among many people that we serve. Um, the other approaches have been just a, a move towards long-acting injectable medications so that people with severe mental illness have medications in their system, um, uh, don't have to struggle with uh, holding on to the pills and addressing adherence by, uh, by, by coupling good psychotherapy with long-acting injectable medications. Um, you know, understanding that the suicide risk is real has been um, uh, really important. So we, we've moved towards just training um, staff and our partner teams to assess for suicide, to be sensitized to suicide risk. And a lot of our sites will train around the Columbia Suicide uh, Severity Rating Scale um, so that folks are screened. And then oftentimes we'll implement safety plans to decrease risk of suicide for people. Um, and then also allocating intensive psychiatric care for those in need. Um, you know, we think it's important to refer rapidly to assertive community treatment or intensive mobile treatment teams. 
but also um, to lower the suicide risk, implement medications like clozapine or lithium too. So um, I think by sort of taking this comprehensive approach, it's, a way, it's been a way to really decrease the syndemic uh, risk that our po patient population and this community is really facing. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Carino. Uh, now we will start the Q&A. So if the panelists, if you all wanna put your videos on so everybody can see you, we um, had, in addition to the Q&A that's coming through the Q&A box, and please everybody do use the Q&A function on Zoom to enter more questions. Somebody in the, in the um, one of the conference participants actually asked, um, has DHS considered making fentanyl test strips available to partners running shelters. And I guess I'd also open that up to the panelists as well. You know, how are your organizations, um, if you didn't talk about it in your presentation, making use of fentanyl test strips? I can comment just briefly on fentanyl test strips. The, um, I think that the intention is good to kind of empower people to know um, what they're using. Um, we have been able to distribute them out of one of our outpatient um, treatment programs at Third Street, but just as a clinical provider who provides, I prescribe a lot of buprenorphine and, and we end up doing lots of urine drug screens as part of the uh, adherence monitoring process. Um, I would say 90%, 95% of my patients that are using heroin have fentanyl in their heroin. So um, I, I think there's sort of a, a perception of more universal contamination of the heroin supply with fentanyl. And so it's not as helpful um, to have a test strip if, if there's pretty much all heroin has fentanyl in it, because it doesn't tell you how much is in it. Um, uh, so I think in settings where there's maybe like more sporadic fentanyl contamination, the test strip can be helpful. But in places like New York, where it's almost like widespread uh, universal contamination with fentanyl, the test strip doesn't always really um, change behavior as much as it might otherwise because the person is in withdrawal and they need, you know, they're sick and, and um, they have to use what they can, what they can find, unfortunately. I could, I could speak to our experience um, at Janney. And so we, we implemented a uh, use of fentanyl test strips following the Rhode Island study that um, was consistent with people uh, saying about two, two thirds to four fifths of people using substances saying that they would alter their uh, pattern of use if they knew fentanyl uh, data around, uh, around their, their substances. And so we've oftentimes um, employed it in, like, in the context of an ongoing relationship. And in particular, when individuals um, sort of have a sense that, you know, that their supply is safer, that they can assess fentanyl, um, that they sort of trust their source, and oftentimes will um, distribute fentanyl like in that context of sort of motivational interviewing and engagement. Um, and our experience is that there are some individuals that come back and say, you know, I've, my substance actually is pretty contaminated. Um, there's fentanyl in there. I've lost people I know to, you know, to fentanyl. And then oftentimes that can be a dialogue that leads to something like MAT, Suboxone, or, or further harm reduction. So it's not been utilized in a way that everyone can test all of their supply, but in these certain circumstances for people in a targeted way in the context of the relationship, we found it to be helpful for people. Thank you all. There were a couple comments that came in on overall the theme of systems coordination, particularly kind of coordination with the healthcare system. So uh, I'll try to lump some of these. So one person had asked what is being, being done um, to coordinate care with hospitals on a higher level and how does respite, fit medical respite, fit into the larger strategy of, pre of preventing homeless deaths? And then somebody else sort of related to that had, had noted, you know, that sometimes they send people to the emergency department and kind of are, are wondering if there's coordination with emergency departments and how to best help their, um, their clients who, who go into emergency departments. I can speak a little to that. Um, certainly Bronx Work has, has been kind of a pivotal role in that. Bronx Works has staff now housed inside of a lot of the emergency rooms in the Bronx because we've seen that most of our clients do uh, when they have nowhere else to go, uh, we'll populate a lot of our emergency rooms. And so uh, we have Bronx Work social workers who outreach people who are homeless and try to engage with them in the emergency room. Um, and they also have been helpful as a liaison. So when um, our clients in Bronx Works get hospitalized, they help connect us to the hospital providers to have a better coordination of care. 
um, and help with discharge planning. Um, and, and that also speaks to the medical respite that, that you were talking about, Kelly. And I know that you're as part of the panel for medical respite as well and a big champion in that. And I, I think it's so critically important, right? We have this filled gap in our care, right? Um, we really have to be physically well and healthy to be in our shelter system right now. And you know, a lot of our clients uh, don't always meet that criteria, especially when they have been recently hospitalized. And so uh, for a place for them to kind of recuperate, uh, a medical respite is just such a great fit. Um, we have had like a micro model that we've been doing with Montefiore for many, many years. Um, and, and, and it's great that there has been talk of like large scaling that and to uh, to provide it for all uh, of the boroughs and uh, communities in the city because it's just so needed. Um, and it, we do have the kind of the right to shelter, which is great. But when people can't take care of themselves the way they need to in that setting, it, it doesn't work for a lot of our for a lot of our patients. So so I'm I'm excited that the medical respite will hopefully be getting off off the ground soon. <laughs> we had another question come in. Somebody asked specifically about heart disease. Somebody noticed that the heart disease deaths are are high, um, you know, both for women and for men. Uh, you know, I would note that in general, heart disease is like the, the leading cause of death in the in the United States. So in some part, uh, some ways it's a reflection. I had also personally wondered, you know, in general, some COVID deaths in the past year have been kind of miscategorized as heart disease in, in all populations, not just the homeless population. But if any of the panelists have any particular comments on heart disease in particular or initiatives that you're doing around heart disease. Uh, just a quick comment on that. We do, um, you know, of course, many of our uh, patients smoke cigarettes and that's like a major driver of heart disease. And I think sometimes that's considered like something in the background of people's lives um, and that we don't often talk about it because they have other bigger, more acute problems. But many of my uh, patients are interested in cutting back and or quitting. And so I think um, thinking through, of course, making medication available, nicotine replacement, but also I think we have a lot of work to do to try to think about creative harm reduction around smoking with um, with safer alternatives, uh, the use of e-cigarettes and things like that, that while not FDA approved and we don't know for sure that they're safer, I think they're likely safer. And I think there's a lot of room for some creative harm reduction around uh, tobacco use, which has clear correlation with um, heart disease risk. Somebody had asked, you know, who, who ultimately is responsible for the, the health and the, the care um, and, and preventing the deaths of all homeless New Yorkers, because DHS has a piece of it, um, but you know, other, they're using multiple systems. So do you all have any thoughts on that? That's kind of a meta question. I think it does, it takes a village, right? I think they all, you know, we all have a role in every, in all of our patients' health and uh, the collaboration that Bronx Works has had with Care for the Homeless and that we work with Montefiore um, and the, the different agencies that can intertwine with somebody with each individual's lives. I think we all have to collaborate um, and work together to help people with their health because it is true, like becoming homeless is so multifactorial. I think the solution also has to be, um, have multiple players. Just to echo that, um, I think that one aspect too is sort of the cont continuity of people's recovery. It's not only sort of getting folks um, to be able to be, be safe off the streets, but then what happens afterwards. And I think that speaks to also ongoing partnerships in supportive housing in which people can get accessible care in an ongoing way and, you know, address issues. Um, the traumatic consequences of homelessness so often is, is internalized to the people that we serve and, and follows them um, into housing. And so it's not only a collaborative approach uh, for when people are street homeless, but also in an ongoing way so people can reintegrate back into the community. Uh, one last question for everybody that actually came in through the chat. Somebody was suggesting kind of a way to, to honor people was suggesting um, uh, one of our client residing in a shelter gains its wings, requesting money to be allocated for a memorial if there's no next of kin. But just as a more general question um, for, for everybody, uh, all of the providers, how, how do you honor and memorialize the people that do pass away um, in, in your program, those who do and those who don't have next of kin? 
So we actually have a, a service for them at the living room because, you know, the living room is a community. It's almost its own family. People live here for, for years and so they get to know each other really well. Um, so we usually put up a picture of the person. People usually write kind of thoughts or reflections or memories of that person. Um, and we spend time kind of reflecting uh, their lives. Um, we did have a death of one of our uh, clients who'd been here since the living room was opened um, and she was undocumented, um, was, you know, not, she had severe mental illness so didn't engage with a lot of community um, and she actually didn't have any known next of kin. Um, our director here, uh, Cassie Desain, she's wonderful and really did a nice piece on her. Actually, we um, had had a, a public, you know, kind of reflection on her. Um, and from that, we had all, several donations of money um, to help with her burial. Um, so that was really nice. And I, I, I agree with the sentiment. I think it's really important um, to have some reflection. Care for the Homeless in general also does it um, once a year or two, twice a year, um, a solstice uh, where we uh, reflect on all of the clients uh, throughout the Care for the Homeless system who have passed. Um, and it is really important, um, especially when they don't have any personal family um, to, to, to share. I also, um, I think it is important to acknowledge that, and we do that at a lot of our programs, and not just the loss to the person, um, but also the loss in the whole community. So it's helpful to come together and acknowledge that through memorials, um, whether that's in the shelter um, or in permanent housing or transitional housing. Wonderful. Well, thank you all. We are running short on time. I'm going to turn it back over to Bonnie, um, but sincere thanks to all of the panelists and everybody for joining. And now over to Bonnie. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Doran, and, um, and to all of our, our panelists. Um, this was um, a difficult but a really important conversation. Um, so we, we thank you for, for sharing your experience, for the work that you do for your patients. Um, and, and also to everyone here on the, on the conference um, and everything that you do, we're, we, um, we honor you and we thank you and uh, we want to keep having this conversation to make sure that we're doing everything that we can to um, you know, keep, keep the people that we serve safe. Um, thank you to um, HSU, Homeless Services United, our co-sponsor of this event. And I um, just want to let you know to please uh, complete that evaluation poll that pops up on your screen if you haven't already. It's really, really helpful for us so that we can keep doing programming like this. And, um, and there's also a, a survey link that's in the, in the chat. And that gives you an opportunity to let us know what other information and resources would be helpful for you to know. We, we're putting on events all the time, so we wanna know how, um, how it can be most helpful. We do have an event coming up on Thursday, April 28th, um, and that's gonna be really an overview of social security benefits um, with, uh, with also a special focus on, um, on long COVID and how, uh, how people who are having ongoing and long-term effects from having COVID can apply and get benefits um, through social, social security. So it's gonna be a really important conversation and training um, and the link to register is just put in the, in the chat box. Um, again, um, we, we will have a recording um, of this and slides that, that will be shared with the exception of DHS. And so that will all be shared with you. Um, and I um, hope you have a good rest of the week. Thank you so much.